God is good. Amen. Amen. Wow, what a song. There's power in the name of Jesus. Woo. <laughs> wow. Woo. All right, kids, you guys enjoy yourself. Enjoy your Sunday school, okay? <laughs> All right. Praise God. Praise God. There is power in the name of Jesus. Woo. <laughs> oh, my, my. You know, sometimes we forget that Father is Jesus came back. <laughs> this is what we forget. Jesus and Father are one. It is such a joy to, to, to love Jesus. Amen. That's Jesus come back. <laughs> God is so good. Let's talk about the panoplia of God today. And we want to go back to Ephesians 6 because we just touched it. Last week, but let's read it together. Let's read it, and we're going to focus in on the, the end section, but let's read 11 through 18 one more time. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Amen. Woo, my, my, my. You know, we covered this top section last week, and we went into the Greek study of these words, because when you go into the ancient text, you can actually start unpacking some of the incredible jewels that are in there, that we glaze over in English. Remember that word, wrestle? We not, we, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against. Look at that verse. It's interesting because in this verse, the word against is used one, two, three, four, and five times. When God revealed this word and it said, and this word was talking about that you wrestling. Remember we talked about what the wrestling pale means? The meaning of that word? It is not just Olympic wrestling, right? Where the two guys are sweaty and just like trying to throw each other down. This was, a, this was the palestrum. This was a place where the three battle arts were, were uh, occurring. And we had the battle art of wrestling and you could grapple and you can choke and break limbs and you could kill your opponent. And then you had the pugilist, you had the boxers. Remember the boxers? What we, what we studied last week? The boxers had knives on their fists. And that's why on the ancient Greek vases you will see boxers with no nose and no ears. Because you're literally having a boxing match with Wolverine from Marvel Comics, if you know what that is. It is that intense. Okay, and then if you survive those matches, then you would go to the top level of mortal combat and you would have all the weapons. You would have any weapon you can take into battle. So that is what Paul, that's the intensity of the battle when Paul is talking about, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against Principe Archon, against Exousia, against Cosmocrateros and against Poneros. And we studied that last week. See, when we understand the intensity of the battle, then we can be prepared. See, the devil wants you to believe that encountering him will be a nice occasion where you can convince him and change his mind. Let me, let me tell you something, folks. The devil got thousands and thousands of years on you. You cannot change his mind. The only person whose mind is going to be changed is you. If you want to talk with the devil. 
we have to understand that when we face, we are called as the followers of Christ to stand against the devil, to battle against him, to be ready for spiritual warfare against him. And if you are not ready for the intensity of the fight, and you're getting ready for an MMA fight in the UFC, and you're practicing ballet, you are in trouble. You are in trouble because your opponent is practicing every day, taking people down, grounding and pounding them, pummeling people, and you're practicing dancing. You see what I mean, folks? We have to understand the nature of the spiritual warfare. There are so many philosophies that will try to trick you out of making you believe, oh, it's not about good versus evil. It's about uh, finding peace in yourself. It's, there's no battle, really. That's an old Zoroastrian thinking type of binary, bifurcated thinking, which only allows and leads up to war. In fact, it's actually the opposite. The only type of thing that leads to war historically is the progression of statism and socialism and communism. These are the things that lead to genocide. It is not people who are filled with the word of God, who stand against unrighteousness and are good because God is good. Amen. So when we look at this whole section, we talked about that whole top section. And we see that even in the world church, we see mother's situation. She is now leading the church away from father. She has redacted the holy, script, holy Bible. The chun song means the heavenly Bible. Can you imagine if you started redacting the Bible, what Christians would say to you, especially if it was 80% of it? What would Muslims do if you started changing 80% of the Quran? You would be beheaded. That's what they would do. And that's already been done. That happened immediately after Father passed. The immediate process of desecration and redaction. I remember he was still in the hospital and they were calling meetings in a Japanese restaurant in Seoul. To have the committee to redact the scriptures. Because after all, those human hands and those human fools know better than God. Right? And then the Chanigu natural, National Anthem, which symbolized the nature of the spirit of Chanigu, that even amidst the deepest suffering and torture, amidst the deepest sorrow of God, there is a son who will claim his glory, and there is a son that will praise him for all the tribulations and crosses that he has to walk. He will give praise to his father. Amen. And that is the national anthem speaking of power and glory. That is where true power comes. And this is what Satan hates. He went after it. He went after the family pledge. He went after the blessing covenants. He went after God himself. God himself. Even though she's my mother and I love her, in her quest to become a goddess, she has changed God to make him a diatheistic God, totally departing from the scripture, totally departing from the root of provenance from the Old and New Testaments. And of course, because you can't explain that, you have to exclude the divine principle from the false constitution, which is nothing other than a slavery document where everybody's a slave of Chung Pyong. And that is a fool. That is a fool who wrote those things, those committees, totally fraudulent, have no authority because guess what? As true parents, inheritor, and successor, I have to approve that. And I did not approve that, even though they tried to get me to do so. And of course, we have seen the pictures where she has left her position. She is sitting in Father's throne. And she's surrounded by people who say, oh, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. Oh, they're one, they're one, wonderful, wonderful. Sit on. This is a, to in Asian culture, this is probably the most insulting thing you can do. It is one of the most insulting things you can do in Asian culture. Especially if you are a family of a king. It is probably one of the most heretical things, actual things you can do as a queen. Sit in the throne of a king and dishonor him. 
This also happens again in Las Vegas, and we can see this happening over and over again with more frequency. We can see what's happening. And we know why this is happening, and Mother has said it herself. Unfortunately, she has admitted why these things have happened. And that is because she's not studied the Bible. She has never heard a divine principle lecture once. She said it publicly. But that she knows everything by just knowing everything. This is the problem because we have departed from the word of God and through the providence from which the word is revealing. And because we have departed from the word of God, and because we have bought into, bought into the devil's theological centers and the devil's schools of theology, which you call college, <laughs> where they indoctrinate you in centralism and statism and communism, but they don't call it that. They call it democracy, but they're teaching you socialism. And of course, the the cherry on the cake, which is the Bible is such an unreliable historical document. The Bible is such an unreliable document. We have Discovery Channel, History Channel, National Geographic, Ge Geographic Channel, all the channels purporting to teach about truth. And they always say, oh, you know, we actually doubt the historicity of the existence of an actual Jesus figure. Or maybe Jesus was not even a real figure. He's a mythical and legendary figure. And all the evidence tends to point to the fact that this figure was just a mythologized this figure of the, of the legend of Osiris. This is such, such an amazing... See, this is why it's such a fraud. See, people who do not study this further and get their information from the Discovery Channel or from National Geographic about Jesus or the Bible... They're fools. They know nothing about the actual historiography of the Bible. None. And you go to Harvard, I went there, you're not going to learn it. You are going to learn a fraudulent, skewed, skewed historiography. Let me show you what I'm talking about. See, when you study whether or not an ancient text is actually reliable, this is called a historiography. It's a historiographical analysis of what is this ancient manuscript or what is this cert certain uh, texts or classics that we're dealing with and how do they how do we how do we see if they're authentic or not well the first thing you have to look at is you have to look at what is the time between when the author wrote the text to the time of its closest copy that we have so let's say the author wrote it, let's say, the author wrote it at 0 AD, and the closest manuscript that we have is 500 AD. So then that would be a 500-year period between when the author wrote it and the first manuscript that we have. Everybody following? That's pretty simple, right? This is the first criteria of historiography. The first criteria. It's a very important criteria. Because when you look at the ancient world and you look at ancient manuscripts, who knows what a manuscript is? What is a manuscript? Go ahead. Somebody call that out. So say it if you know it. Okay, it's a text. But more specific, what is a manuscript? It's a handwritten document. Because they didn't have movable type or they didn't have uh, typewriters or Apple computers, right? They had, they had to hand write this. And most of the time, this was done on papyra reeds, which were flattened out, weaved together, and they became paper upon which they wrote. And these things would disintegrate. So these things on ancient classical works, when you look at the dates between when they were actually written and then the time of the closest copy that we have today... Guess what we find? Let's look at Pliny the Younger, one of the imperial magistrates of Rome who wrote about the imperial network of all the things we know about the imperial Rome. You know all those programs on History Channel, all those programs on Discovery Channel, all those programs on National Geographic about Rome? We know them primarily through Pliny the Younger. Pliny the Younger and his works. Guess what? He was writing, the date between when he was writing and the earliest copy that we have is 750 years. It's 750 years. 
Now you can assume that you want a smaller gap because the smaller gap you have, the more the less chance you have of redactions, right? Or changes or misprints or whatever they are, right? Interpolations, that's just a fancy word to say somebody else put something in, right? So you want a shorter period, the longer the period, the more open, susceptible it is to corruptions, right? This makes sense, right? Almost all of the information we have on Imperial Rome, that when you go to your colleges and spend $200,000 for the Ivy Leagues and you go learn history, you are studying the works of Pliny, you are looking at Rome and Greek, Greece, th the Greco-Roman period through Pliny. That's how you are trying to uncover the histo historical evidence of what Rome was like. All the fields of archaeology are connected to this as well. Then you go out and try to find physical evidence, etc. Look at this, Plato. Plato, the, from the time he wrote to the time that we have the earliest manuscript of his documents, 1,200 years. 1,200 years. We have 1,200 years between Plato's tetralogies and then what we have today. How many have gone to a liberal arts school? How many have you gone to a liberal arts university? Which is just another fancy word for theological, uh, theological uh, school of Satan. <laughs> that's just another fancy word for that. Because that's all you're going to learn. And you're going to learn that you have to learn the classics. What they call the classics of Western civilization. And you will have to study Plato and his tetralogies and the cave and the republic and his different ideas on the nature of the mind. You will have to study all these things. And you will be taught as if you're reading or that there is no doubt in anybody's mind that Plato's text is not corrupt. Even though there's 1,200 year gap, none of your professors, your socialist professors, will tell you that it is 1,200 year gap and that there is serious, 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 serious problematic situations with that kind of time gap. They will teach you Plato as if it's the gospel truth, amen? Who's taking philosophy in college? They will teach you as if you have Plato's original manuscripts, right? They will teach you with so much certainty, and yet those same professors will say, oh, and that Bible thing, that is so unreliable. Look at Herodotus, from which we get most of our ancient information about the Greek culture. Historian, he's a historian of the Greek culture. Look at him, the time that passed from when he was writing to the closest document we have of him is 1,300 years. 1,300 years. Look at Caesar. Julius Caesar. The, the documents of his autobiography that he wrote and when we have them, the distance of time is 1,000 years. 1,000 years. There's a lot that could be added and interpolated in in that much time, right? That's always the argument they give with the Bible, right? Homer, the Iliad, 500 years pass when Homer writes his Iliad to the first copy that we have. See, this is the work of antiquity. This is, these are all the classics. This is, some of the names, I don't even know. Some of those names, do you know all those names? These are, the, these are the historians from which we, the modern, quote, scholarly fields, are reconstructing their knowledge of ancient Greek and Greece and Rome. And they speak about it as if it's the gospel truth. But look how much time gap there is. Now, how much time gap for the New Testament? How much time gap is there for the New Testament or the Bible? Is it 500 years? Like many like to say. Some people are so fools, they're such fools, that they think, oh, the Bible came into existence when in the Council of Nicaea in 325, when, Const in, when Constantine tried to centralize Christianity using the, the church bishops. How many people thought that? Or know somebody who thought that? That's like 300 years after Jesus. They're fools. T 
total fools. When you understand, what, look, look where the real New Testament, how much time, how much time from when the New Testament was written to the time, the first copy that we have, what is the time? The time is 40 years. 40 years. Not 500 years, not 800 years, not 1,300 years, not 1,400 years, not hundreds and hundreds of years. It's 40 years. Guess what? There's no text in all of classical antiquity, not one that is this close to the original text. Not one. This is how unbelievably close the scripture is in terms of time. You now, you l- remember, we're, th- we're looking back 2,000 years to have an ancient document about the New Testament within 40 years is incredible. Look at this Aristotle's Poetics, 1,400 year time gap. Plutarch, 800 year time gap. Josephus, 800 year time gap. The average historical Ancient writer has a 500-year time gap. Isn't that incredible? And yet we teach ancient history as if it's the gospel truth with the average of 500 years. And those very same hypocrites who call themselves historians laugh at the Bible saying that it's not a historical text. When In terms of actual evidence, it is the closest, closest in terms of historiography of any ancient manuscript, period. You can't can't come close with it. See, this is what those indoctrination centers don't want you to know about reality because they want you to buy into the satanic agenda which is, of course, build up centralized power, let Satan rule and reign and become his slaves, <laughs> in a nutshell. Forty years. Dan Wallace, who's a leading world textual critic, says, we have more and earlier manuscript evidence of Jesus than Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great. Notice how all these doubters of Jesus' historiography, Jesus actually existed. You'll see young people say, well, I don't even know if Jesus existed. I saw a program on the Discovery Channel that said, Jesus may be a mythical figure. And not only young people, I'm t- their college professors are telling them that. And so is discovery, history, whatever, those channels, you know, all those channels. If, but notice that nobody doubts the existence of Julius Caesar. And nobody doubts the existence of Alexander the Great. But yet, when it comes to Jesus, they want to say that he's a mythical legend, that he didn't exist. Well, let's go into the second point of historiography. The second point of historiography is to understand how many manuscripts do we have? So with, for example, Caesar, all we know about Caesar is from 10 manuscripts. That's all we know. Everything we know about Julius Caesar is from 10 manuscripts, 10. Now, you want to have a lot of manuscripts because the more manuscripts you have, you may find differences, but you can find common themes. You can find threads which tie all those manuscripts together, which will then be a, you will be able to reconstruct the closest original. Do you see what I mean? That's why you want a whole bunch of the manuscripts. The more manuscripts you have, the better for the scholar because now you can piece together what the original was. So we'll get all of Caesar's stuff, and nobody doubts Caesar existed. I don't see no, uh, I don't see any uh, history channel program saying, was Caesar just a myth or legend? (laughs) Alexander the Great, myth and legend. You'll never find it. You'll only find it about Jesus Christ. You know why? Because Satan hates Jesus. Jesus Christ. He hates him. And if and what you believe about Jesus will impact your eternal life forever. What you believe about Julius Caesar or Alexander Great doesn't matter, but what you believe about Jesus Christ 
will affect your eternal life. That's why Satan doesn't want you. That's why he wants you to think he's a legend, a fictitious cloud in the, in the annals of history. Plato's tetralogies, all of Plato's work. When I studied philosophy, all we had to, we had to study Plato, we had to study Aristotle, all those guys, and we just, we, we just thought we had the original manuscripts. We had no idea. All we know from Aristotle and Plato are from, I'm sorry, from Plato, seven manuscripts. That's it. You have seven manuscripts about Plato, but with Plato's tetralogies. Tacitus, who was probably one of the most uh, uh, well-known Roman historians over a thousand years between when he wrote and the closest manuscripts. And there's only 33 manuscripts. This was the latest number that I heard. 33 manuscripts. That's all they have for Tacitus. And we base our almost our entire knowledge of the Roman Empire on Tacitus. Isn't that fascinating? Aristotle only has 49 manuscripts. 49. That's pretty good. That's pretty good compared to Plato or compared to Caesar. Amen. He's got 49. That's pretty good. The Bible, the Old and New Testaments barely beat Aristotle because they have 53. Thousand. Fifty three thousand manuscripts of the Old and the New Testament. Twenty seven thousand plus manuscript of the New Testament. Five thousand eight hundred in Greek Old Testament. Twenty six manuscripts about the Bible. Twenty six thousand combined. Fifty three thousand manuscripts. Ancient manuscripts of the Bible. It is by far the most credible ancient text in all of the world. The most credible. If you doubt the credibility or the antiquity of the Bible, you're doubting all of classical history, philosophy, Plato, Aristotle, you're doubting it all. Because they don't even have close to 53,000. Plato's got seven Aristotle's got 49. That's not even 100. The Bible has 53,000 manuscripts. See, this is what those foolish deceivers, the liars through their teeth, the centralists, the statists, the people who want slaves, control people as slaves, this is what they don't want you to realize about this book. It is the most credible ancient text in the world. The most. You doubt it? That's your problem. Now you have to doubt Plato, Aristotle, Josephus, Tacitus, Herodotus, Sophocles, every single Plutarch. You have to doubt every single one and throw them as a mythical legend. The number third book in the ancient world is the Iliad with 1,800 extant copies, manuscripts. 1,800 copies. That's pretty good in the ancient world. That's a very popular text, as you can see. 1,800 manuscripts. That's pretty popular. 1,800. That's pretty popular. Nowhere near to 53,000. Do you see the massive difference of the historiography of the, of the Bible? The average ancient manuscripts, if you stack them up, they would be about four feet tall, maybe around here or so, of an ancient writer. They stacked all those papyri together, they'd be about this tall. If you stack just the New Testament from the ground, it would go one mile high in the sky. You add the Old Testament, it goes another mile up. <laughs> the evidence, the evidence, historiographically speaking, of the Bible is by far the best of any classical text, any, no comparison. Do you, see how, do you see how that when you're in those, quote, liberal arts institutions where are, quote, seeking for truth, the Harvard Shield has the name Veritas on it, which means truth. Hey, Harvard, how come you didn't teach me this when I was there? 
How come we always got the mythology of Jesus Christ? How come we got, oh, is he a legendary figure? And we didn't get the actual facts of historiography. In fact, more New Testament copies are written in the first 200 years than the average Greek or Roman classical writer in 2,000 years. What is it about this Jesus? He's lived for 33 years. He only has a three-year ministry and 53,000 manuscripts about this one guy? What is it about this man who was born in poverty, died as a criminal? He should be forgotten in history. Why, why do we have so much about him? There are some common objections that scholars make about Mark 16. This is the ending of Mark 16, 12 to 20. They say it's a later interpolation, and they talk about also John 7 and 8 with the woman of adultery, where Jesus says, let not he without sin cast the first stone. And they talk about that in the early manuscripts, there are not, this story does not exist, John 7 or 8. And there have been scholars of the atheist side or, or the centralist status side who said, well, look, we can't trust the Bible because John 7 and 8 and Math, Mark 16. We can't trust the entire text because those two problematic areas. You know what all that it shows? All that Mark 16 and John 7 shows is that there may be an issue, scholarly issue, about Mark 16 and John 7. <laughs> and each of those are like two passages long. So you're telling me out of the entire New Testament, you can only find four to eight sentences that are problematic. And everything else, historiographically, scholars, even who are atheists, agree is legitimate. You know why? Because, folks, see, we think, we, let, me, let, me, let me see a show of hands if you heard this one. Well, you know, Jesus died in a cross. We don't even know if the crucifixion happened, or we don't know if he rose from the dead. You know, those, the Gospels were written much after, much longer after he, was, he existed and he, and he died. You know, for example, like Matthew was written in 50 to 60 A.D. John was written in 110 A.D. about. And there were different communities that were using those various texts. And they were using those, the different forms of worship and Jesus. And then in about 300 A.D., the Catholic Church consolidated all things and centered around the ritual of the, of the blood and body of Christ or the sacrament of the, of, the holy, of, the, of the wine, the Mass, the ritual of Mass. And they selectively chose those Gospels. They selectively chose those four Gospels, which are written much longer after Jesus actually lived, if he even lived at all. How many have heard something of that? Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> yes, of course. They all, of course, want to tell you there's 300,000 300, to 400,000 variants between the New Testament copies. They're very unreliable because they vary so much from copy to copy. We actually can't, they, they, may, they may be up to 400,000 different communities that were using these texts, for all for their all different purposes, right? But when you look at even those variants, only 75 to 80 percent are spelling errors. For example, like the Gospel of Mark, when they wrote, he went to Galilee, the, the, when they copy it, they'll write, Jesus went to Galilee, or write, Jesus Christ went to Galilee, or Lord Jesus Christ. They're actually adding meaning to the text. They're not taking away from meaning. In fact, less than 1% of all the variations between the copies of the New Testament have to do anything with meaning. And not one, not one of the differences out of 400 thousand New Testament manuscripts, I'm sorry, variants, 400,000 variants, not one has to do with the core doctrine or essential doctrine of Christianity. Not one. But of course, they don't want you to have knowledge because if you don't have knowledge, you will fall right in to what they want you to believe, which is Jesus is a mythical figure. And the Old Testament is a mythical book. And you don't have to follow it. You create your own morality, guys. 
What happened? That's what Hitler believed, isn't it? He created his own morality. If somebody says, you guys who are going off to college, if somebody ever says, hey, 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 you can't enforce your moral beliefs on me, hey, you know, it's like, you know, it's like ice cream. Yeah, I choose one color, you, cho you choose one flavor. You know, you can, nobody can tell you, no, you know, nobody can say that, you know, you're wrong or you're right when it comes to morality. If somebody says it to him, go into the dorm room and steal their radio. Take it. <laughs> you take your radio and say, oh, why, why are you stealing my radio? Oh, this is just, this is what I believe and that's what you believe. But you really can't tell me what I believe is wrong. This is called moral relativism. It's the stupidest type of philosophy. Anybody with half a brain can analyze and critique it so quick. But we have so many people who are critically brain dead. And when they go into college, they fall into the moral relativism that is at the root of Satan. It's at the root. That's what the fall was all about, fool, uh, folks. It was about... <laughs> I'm talking to them when I say fools, okay? <laughs> the fall was about moral relativism. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not... That's, it, you're not going to die. You eat that. Well, God said that. You're not, it's not really true. You create your own truth. You create your own law. You don't, it depends on how you interpret it. You see, this is what America has fallen prey to. We have fallen prey to the wiles of the devil. Remember the Ephesians 11 says, put on the panoply of the whole armor of God so that you may withstand the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil are what? The methodos, the methodia, the well-trodden road. The odos is the road. Odometer is road. Odos, the well-traveled road. What Satan traps us in, humanity in, constantly, over and over. Same method, same tactic. And that's why God gives us the armor of God. Look at this. This is Ephesians 14. Now, now we're going into actual the armor. We talked about last week, we talked about the shield of faith, and we talked about the, the feet, the feet, the shoes of peace. Remember the shoes of peace? Remember this, the shoes of peace? With the uh, nails attached to the bottom, remember that? These are the Roman soldier shoes of peace. And they kick you with them. They're, they're killer shoes. And remember what that word peace means in the, in, the, uh, in the Greek arena? It means calmness in battle. It doesn't mean a fake internal peace. You're sitting there and having peace with yourself. It means when you are in battle, you have calmness. You have peace. Your feet are not trembling. You're at peace. In a samurai, if you Japanese uh, people who study samurai traditions, it's like mushin, no mind while in battle. That's what he means by the peace, your feet shod with the preparation of gospel peace. It's in battle. It is one of your weapons, but it's your ability to remain calm in the fight. And everybody knows who is a martial artist or a warrior knows that that is critical in battle. So we talked about that last week. We also talked about the shield of faith, that you had to dip it in the water and you had to anoint it with oil. Remember that? Every week, every day, you had to anoint it with the oil so the leather would not become brittle and you would dip it in the water, saturate it, so that when the fiery arrows came, they would be put out when they go into your shield. Isn't that interesting? But let's go into... The first thing that Paul talks about. He talks about, have your loins girt about with truth. This is what was known as the loin belt. The loin belt. Now, if you said, if you looked at a piece of, Greco, if you looked at a piece of Roman armor, what is your eye attracted to qu uh, most quickly? Okay, the red plumes on the, on, the, on the helmet. What else are you attracted to? Real quick. Maybe the six-pack. You see the six-pack? <laughs> right? Right? See, see, these things are very noticeable. But the most important part of the Roman army, the seven pieces of armor, was the loin belt. The loin belt was the most important piece of armor. See, it's a hidden piece of armor. It's not even something that's out in the open or shiny or ornate. But it was the most important piece of your armor. Because... If you did not have your loin belt on, your breastplate would be flopping around while you're fighting. 
And if you had to run and engage somebody in combat, the thing would be flying, it could fly off of you. The loin connect the breastplate onto you so that it would fit snug and you could move in battle without having the insecurity of feeling, oh my gosh, my breastplate is falling off. Isn't that interesting? The loin belt held, it was underneath this part, there are straps where the belt is connected to the breastplate. Isn't that fascinating? Also, the loin belt was a place where you would put your shield when you are marching. So when you're not in turtle formation, which we saw here, when you actually have your shields out, and you're marching, the belt had a clip on which you could hang your shield. And of course, on your belt was your what? Sword. So notice that. The loin belt is the thing that connects the breastplate. It connects the whole piece of armor together. These tassels were then connected to the greaves. The greaves would be connected in terms of armor would be down here. This is where your shin guards would be. And so it was an, it was an extension of the loin belt. Notice how when you get in the, up in the morning and you put your pants on, what is the first thing you do? You put your belt on, right? If you don't have your belt and your pants are a little big, what happened? They, don't know. they start falling down. You start insulting people when you bend over. <laughs> or scaring people away. <laughs> okay? Your shirt can start coming untucked, right? Everything starts unraveling when you don't have your belt on. Now, for the armor of God, for the armor of the soldier of God, the belt of truth is what held the breastplate of righteousness. Notice that. The truth, the word of God, the truth, the word of God, the truth holds your sense of righteousness. Notice this. When we start departing from the word of God and the Bible... It's not a natural part of our life. It's not a living word like it was for Father. When he was revealing divine principle, all he had was a Bible. It's a living word. That's all he knows is a Bible. He studied that. That's everything he knows of revelation is from the Bible. If, you, if we depart from that, notice this. Your sense of righteousness starts fading. Notice this. When your belt, when you don't put on your belt of truth, and you're not going into the truth, you're not strapping on truth on you every morning, and do, you know, that's why Father said, do hundukki, right? Not strapping that on. What happens to your shield of faith? If your belt is not there, your shield of faith cannot rest anywhere, and it will start to fade. Notice that when you don't put on your belt of truth and go into the Word, your sword, which will slay the enemy in close quarter combat, which Paul talks about as the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God here is not logos of God. It is Rima of God. Different. The Logos of God is the written word of God. It is the spoken word of God. A Rima of God, a word of God here in this context, the sword is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The Rima means a specific quickened word for you at that moment. Let me give an example. When Jesus was in the wilderness battling Satan, and he came to Jesus and said, if you're the son of God, then turn these stones into bread. What did Jesus say? Man, will not man does not live by bread alone. That was a rima. You see, when Satan attacked him, a word of the scripture came out and slay Satan. You see what I mean? That was, that's a rima. What did the second one say? What happened with the second one? And he said, well, Jesus, if you're the son of God, well, why don't you jump down from this temple and the angels will save you? And what do he say? You shall not tempt the Lord thy God. Another Rima. That's a Rima. Close court of combat. And what do he say? The last one. Come down and bow down before me. All the kingdoms of the world will be yours. And what do he say? You shall worship the Lord thy God alone. Right? What was that? A Rima. It was a Rima. That's the difference between a rima and the word. 
A rima is a quickened verse of scripture that comes to you in the close quarter combat that you have when you're battling an archon, when you're battling an exousia, or when you're battling a cosmocrateros, or when you're battling a poneros. Amen? And that's why, and that's why when we have an issue and we're under the duress of the devil oppressing us, we go to the word and open it quickly and get the rima. Remember that? Open the word. Quick, go to it. Get your Bible over. Boom, it'll come out. The word that is quickened to you will be given. Go to the trench and go. Open it. Read it anywhere. Go, go. Don't think. Boom. That's your rima. That's your sword that you will use in combat. Close quarters. The belt of truth was the critical piece. The belt of truth held everything up. It is the most underrated piece, but it is the most critical piece because it held the whole thing together. Your breastplate of righteousness. Did you know that the breastplate was also an offensive weapon? The breastplate was not only defensive. It was called a thorax, from which we get the English word thorax. And, it, and this is the breastplate. It was a defensive weapon, which would protect your vital organs. But also, did you know what it did? It was made of brass like that. And it would have a metallic luster as the pieces rubbed on each other, and it would become very shiny. Have you ever noticed if you drove in a desert and you saw something shining, flashing far away, you can see it and it blinds your eyes? Well, a skilled Roman soldier would use the sun against his enemy. And he would go where the light is reflecting onto his enemy and then attack him. Woo! Isn't that interesting? And that is why when you have the the the, the, the belt of the loin is connected to your luster for, of your righteousness. Notice this, the breastplate is not something of you. It's a plate you have to put on you. Isn't that interesting? Look how many religious people think that they're righteous because they did something, including so many unificationists, right? They think the righteousness is their skin. Whereas, look what happened. The righteousness of God is not of you. You put it on. It's the righteousness of God, not of us. It's the righteousness of Jesus, not of us. It's the righteousness of Father, not of us. That's what we put on. That's why we're righteous before God and Satan can't hit us or touch us. And that's why we have a metallic luster that shines and blinds the enemy. Not because of what you've done or the conditions you've done or all the things that you think you did. No. You put on righteousness. The Bible says it is a gift of righteousness just as is a gift of grace. Whoa, look at this. The belt of truth also guards your loins. Remember what a loin is, folks? What is a loins? What are your loins? Remember what I said? Don't point to them right now. Your loins are your what? They are your sexual organs. They are your reproductive organs. Notice that the belt of truth, when you are in the, when you are fastening truth around you every day and you are in the word, your sexual organs are protected. Ooh, you see, you hear that? The organs are protected, which carry the what? The lineage. lineage. What did the Bible say? It said, and those who are saved would not, should not commit sin because we have his seed. Remember this scripture in 1 John? This is a scripture that says his seed. What is the Greek word for seed? It is spermata. 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 From which we get the English word sperm. What was the OSDP, Original Substance Divine Principle, all about? It was all about what the English translator tra translators translated as the lineage, but what Father was saying was spermata. He was saying chungja, which in Korea means spermata, is what it means. The seed and lineage of God. Notice that when you are fastened up with the belt of truth and you are going to your scripture which is your belt that bible is your belt that chun sung is your belt when you are fastening that around you every day notice the skirt the, the protectors go down 
Isn't that amazing? Your loins are protected. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Now, what's fascinating about this is that it also ties the helmet of salvation. The helmet also, if it got too hot for a Roman soldier, it was a 25, up to a 25-pound helmet. It was the most ornate piece of equipment. And if I was wearing it, I'd probably stand about three feet higher, and you would definitely notice that I have a big peacock helmet on my head. <laughs> it was probably the most ornate system of the protecting the head but notice this that even when the roman soldier wanted to rest he could hold it but he could also clip the helmet where to his belt isn't that interesting see when you know that of salvation when you know that father walked through the crosses of love that he bled and was tortured for me and my salvation and he paid the all the indemnity of my ancestors until adam and eve and he freed me and liberated me and gave me new life when you had know that from that comes and rests on your belt of truth and you put that on you have a helmet of salvation you have a helmet that is surrounded by salvation Amen? So when the devil tries to say, you're weak, you stink, you're a heretic, you're a this or that, and you can't be, you, 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 you know, etc., you can't do that, you'll never succeed, whatever it is, you can say, I have the helmet of salvation of God. He paid for my victory already. My victory is already there, devil. And you say, get thee behind me, Satan. Amen? It's all connected to the loin belt. The belt is the key of all of these. Now it's interesting because when you look at the sword of the Roman soldier, the Bible talks about the sword as a sharp two-edged sword, which can divide asunder the soul and the spirit, which can divide asunder the bone and the marrow. Remember that? The word for two-edged sword is diastomos, two-edged, is diastomos. Di meaning two, stomos meaning mouth. It means mouth. That is so weird. Everybody translated it as two-edged sword. The actual Greek says a two-mouthed sword. Isn't that interesting? In the book of Revelation, when Jesus is on the throne, and he has the seven stars in his hands, and he has the eyes of fire and the hair like sheep's wool, white as wool, and the, from his mouth, what? Comes a sharp, two-edged, diastomo sword. Isn't that fascinating? Why is it two-mouthed? We thought it was two-edged. Why is it two-mouthed sword? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Rima of God, has two mouths. It comes from the Word of God, which is the first mouth. But then when you have the Rima, you have to declare it before Satan, which then becomes the second mouth, which then becomes a two-edged sword that separates Satan from your life. It is a two-mouthed sword, and you must wield it with two mouths. It comes from the Word of God, his mouth, but then it must be uttered through your mouth. And this is what we see. Remember when we did those declarations? You can see how Satan's kingdom crumble after those declarations. Because I had to muster up that, 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 that faith in Father, who he saw wh uh, who I was. And not try to please everybody, but I had to stand in what he said I am, and I had to declare. And when I did, you can see Satan's kingdom collapsing. The falsity collapsed, all that collapsing. The diastoma sword. This sword was a machaira. It was a, one of the five different types of swords of the Roman guard. They had one sword, which was a single-edged sword, which was two-handed sword. They had one sword, which was 17, 16 inches long. They had one sword that was like a dagger. You stab your heart, the enemy's heart, with it. And they had one sword like a fencing pole that you would fight with from a horse. But this is the word Machaira. It's, it's a different type of sword. It is a 17-inch, a 19-inch sword. And it is a sword that has a little bit of a turn on the top. So when you stabbed your opponent and you twisted it, it would shred his organs up inside. And when you pulled it out because it was double-edged, it would cut again. And all his innards would come out and pour out as he fell onto a pool of blood. 
And that you would know this guy is dead. You would know this aggressor is dead with this Machaira sword. When we understand the weaponry that God has given us as warriors of God, and we stand in his righteousness with the helmet, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, calmness, peace, and the shield of faith, there is no archon, no Satan, no principality, no power exousia, no cosmocrateros, no poneros, no wicked or evil thing that is coming against you that can defeat you when you put on the armor of God. But you have to put it on. God gave it to you. So many of us leave it on the floor. You got to now Except that you are a warrior for God, that you are standing protecting his holy name and put on your armor and stand strong against the enemy who is a liar and a deceiver and one that will fall because that is who he is, a fallen fool. Amma, you want to say something on that? Thank you so much. Let us give one more big round of applause to Pastor Moon. I feel so safe today that I'm wearing belt. <laughs> Whenever I wear belt, I'll remember this. <laughs> belt of truth. <laughs> you know, many of you know that um, in our church history, we did a, a lot of uh, divine principle workshop, right? We do one day divine principle workshop, three days, seven days, 21 days, 40 days workshop, and etc. And in the early era of our church, whenever there was a, a 40 days uh, workshop, there was a one thing that was strongly recommended to the participant in the workshop. That was a reading Bible one time from the cover during those uh, uh, 40 days workshop. And a lot of uh, early uh, you know, uh, 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 members who joined in our church, they, they actually did that. While they're doing the 40 days workshop, they try to at least read the Bible from, you know, from Genesis to Revelation. And because of that, we had a so much Holy Spirit experience. Some people who kneel down as they pray, their, their body just totally paralyzed and they can't move. And they, many of them had experience of uh, speaking tongues. And some of, many of them had a you know, Holy Spirit experience. And you know, we can, there's a countless, countless uh, Holy Spirit experience. But as time goes by, you know, around the 80s, you know, I become, I become um, Sunday schoolers. And then as I sitting in the Sunday school room, teacher, actually Sunday school teacher talked about and taught about the Bible stories. And oh yeah, Bible stories. And oh, it's a Jonah, about Jonah and Jesus walking the water. We learn about that. And then, but there was something strange thing. We are learning about Bible. At the same time, we cut down the credibility of Bible. And those two things were coexisting. Yeah, we teach about Bible, but you know, the more important thing is uh, learning about only divine principle, and you know, that is important. But at the same time, we, it's almost like uh, we can't make up our mind kind of thing, right? And then when my husband was, uh, um, when we were doing uh, ministry in Korea at the end of uh, uh, 2000, right? They did not teach Bible at all in the Sunday school in Korea. So we, my husband and I had to strongly recommend it and persuade the Sunday school teachers in the, in the church that we have to get back to Bible and we have to get back to Bible stories so that our young people can know about Bible. See how you can see the, um, you know, how we are cutting down the authority of a Bible over time? Like this, and then the, and no wonder that we don't have a you know Holy Spirit experience in our church because we chase out Bible in our church and we we only thought that divine principle is most important and we don't need a Bible because of our that thought we lost the Holy Spirit experience in our church and Father was real we know Father was Messiah but. 
what is wrong with us? We were like, uh, we're pulling our hair, and what is wrong with us? Maybe it's because of organization, maybe because of this and that, but we were not seeing the real, real cause of all this. You know, I understand that we got a lot of persecution from Christians that made us drive from, you know, Bible and Jesus. And, you know, but I, I when I, really see myself, I don't have to even talk about anybody else, but when I see deep in my, deep inside of me, I was actually became arrogant. My attitude became arrogant toward the Bible. And thinking that, oh, you know what, you know, I, I just only know a handful of people's name in Bible and what they did, but I know about Bible all because I learned it from Divine Principles, see? And when I hear like uh, some of a uh, uh, you know name that that is not familiar from the Bible, then my confidence about Bible and my faith about uh, toward Father just drop to the sink. Yeah. Oh, oh, those names are in the Bible. Maybe, yeah. Not only in his Bible, in my Bible, their name is in there, right? But it, it just uh, goes on and on and roller coaster, like a roller coaster. And we eventually, as a second gen who never learned about Bible and the authenticity of Bible and authority of a Bible, we just uh, lose our confidence in our, in, in our religion and in, uh, in even Father, in even true Father. Because we don't know what Messiah is. We don't know who, how much preparation is there to receive a Messiah. We don't know the joy and the, the, the just the overwhelming, um, you know, unspeakable joy to find the Christ in our, in our life, see? Because we don't know about Bible. Brother and sister, as I study Bible and deeper and deeper, you know what I realized? True Father and Jesus are truly one. When Jesus turned over the table in the temple, when Jesus you know, burned the, um, in the fig leaves because it doesn't bear seed, when Jesus called the, you know, the, the Pharisees, you are the children, viper, children of a devil, and I came before Abraham, and all these things. There are so many things we could not understand about Father, right? But just like a Jesus, he set up his condition and whatever he had to say for people, just like you and me, after 2,000 years later, Father was speaking those words to us, thinking, after 2,000 years, who will read my words? Brothers and sisters, let us go back to our wor words. Let us go back to our truth, our Bible, and, and divine principle. And when we do that, you know what? Father's Holy Spirit will come down into our life. He will answer our prayer. And you know what? And we will love our Lord forever and ever. I choose. Amen, amen. The Bible is the only test. Satan hates the Bible. Satan hates the Bible. You know why? Because the Bible is the only word that tells you about the Messiah. And the Bible is the only word that tells you how he will be when he comes back. And if Satan can make you think the Bible is a myth, he's got you and you belong to him. There are so many people who think they know the principle, have no grasp of the Bible, and wonder why their faith is always shaking. You have to have the root of Father. What was the root of Father when he revealed the divine principle? The perfect knowledge of the Bible. He knew it from Genesis to Revelation. He could preach the Bible, speak the Bible, quote the Bible. All he had was the Bible. That's how much control he had over the, over the Scripture and the Word of God. I am sick and tired of all these people who are claiming to be of God but do not understand or stand on biblical morality. The Bible teaches us what our morality is. It teaches us multiculturalism or spiritual relativism, moral relativism is false. It teaches us that self-worship is false. It teaches us idol worship is false. It teaches us that we don't get our righteousness from ourselves, from God. It teaches us only God is good. It teaches us that we have sin. It 
It teaches us that through Christ's grace and love, we are redeemed. And that message of God's true love is the foundation upon which Father talks about true love in the divine principle. In every single chapter, it's on that foundation of biblical morality and understanding. And if you try to understand Father through multiculturalism, Buddhism, Hinduism, I've tried to do it. You will never, ever understand him, and you will be creating a false messiah because he stands on biblical morality and biblical truth. And this is why we have strayed so far as a church. But not here, because here we are proud to announce that for the first time the unification movement from the beginning days of father we will have the first youth bible-based summer camp courtesy of greg knoll at bluestone we will have have it there but for the first time in the history of the church since the beginning it will be a bible-based bible-based study of the principle and have all those great activities in summer camp let's give let's give greg a thank you for that and as we return to the word of god that's when we can start putting on our armor and becoming warriors of God. Let's read Chan Sung Young. Uh, Chan Sung Young here. Let's read together. In transforming the lineage, unless the condition for victory is fulfilled inside Adam's bone marrow and the core of his flesh and blood through binding God's love to the seed that will be the child in the future, God's child cannot be born in the future. This is a logical certainty. Isn't this recorded in the Bible? If so, the Bible is surely God's word. Let's give God some praise as we return back to his word and his truth and his foundation and give him all the glory. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Let's, I want you all to, I'm, I ask you all to stand. And if anybody wants to come down for prayer or you want to just say before God, come, you know, God, I want to center on your word again. I want to make this day the the day that I will commit myself to opening my Bible and fastening that belt of truth around me. If you want to make that commitment today and you feel the spirit pushing on your heart to become a warrior, come on down here. Let's make that promise together. Let's stand together in agreement as warriors of Christ. Let's go back to the Word and arm ourselves with the true power of the Word, which will give us the power to defeat any wiles of Satan. And let's also take this time to repent together. We'll do a collective repenting because we did stray from the Word. Look at the world church. Look how much it's straying. The reason why mother can sit on Father Stone is because she does not read her Bible. It is so clear. But as that is happening, we have to stand on the word of God, which is the foundation of the principle. Amen. Father, we ask you right now, we come in agreement as your children, Father, and we want to repent before you, Father. We have not kept the word of God as the belt of truth that girds our loins, Father. That's why we've had so many fallen histories, so many adulterous situations that we've seen, things that should not happen to bless, blessed people, blessed families. But Father, we don't stand here to condemn others' actions, but we stand here to make a personal commitment today, right here, right now, before you in heaven. Father, we want to return to your word. We want to gird our loins about with the truth of your word. We want to attach that to our righteousness and sense of righteousness that is our breastplate. Father, we want to attach our shield of faith to that truth. We want to attach our sword of the spirit that comes from that belt. We want to rest our helmet of salvation on that belt. And Father, that our feet would be shod with the gospel, the preparation of the gospel of peace. Father, we stand as your holy army, your soldiers of Christ, who stand and know who their king is, who stand to protect you with our lives, no matter what type of obstacle the devil puts in our way or tries to intimidate us with. We stand with your heavenly armor this day. And Father, tighten that belt around us this day. Make us go to the word. Give us a rima of the word so that we may slay the archon and slay the cosmocrateros that are trying to destroy our families and our lives. Father, we are powerful in you. We are righteous in you. We are saved in you. We have, we have might in you. And we have the sword that will divide asunder 
the bone and the marrow will separate Satan in half and we will stand victorious upon his body as we glorify your spirit that gives us all power and might. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor. We report this as Central Blessed Families now committing to get back to the word and we give you all the praise, glory, and honor and in your precious name we pray. Let's give God some praise, everybody. Hug your neighbor. Tell them, warrior, get your belt on. Amen. 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 <laughs> Amen.